The Trigger is actually two books um, in, in one. Um, the first half of the book demolishes the official story of 9-11, and the second half um, tells an amazing story which leads to who actually did it, and it wasn't 19 Islamic hijackers. Um, and the, uh, the point of the title, The Trigger, is that 9-11 was the trigger. Uh, if you um, look at the sequence of events that has uh, happened since 9-11, both in uh, attempted uh, and in some cases achieved regime change in the Middle East, and you look at the disappearance of privacy, the uh, emergence of the Big Brother state, uh, this is uh, something that followed, in terms of the speed of it unfolding, it followed 9-11, which was the trigger to start this sequence, which is still going on. And, and uh, th there are many phases of it to come unless uh, people in large numbers start to realize what's actually happening and that events that seem to be on the face of it completely unconnected are fundamentally connected. Whether it's Greta Thunberg or whether it's impeachment of Trump, uh, indeed the uh, emergence of Trump, uh, and so many other things that are happening today, they're all connected to a particular agenda. You know, back uh, before uh, we were going to have you on the uh, air earlier, but I had a situation with my wife I had to take care of uh, with regard to her surgeries. And what was interesting is that as I was reading along in the trigger and actually going back, I started realizing some things about 9-11. And that was like, for example, the Patriot Act it was like a 300 page document that was like produced within weeks of 9-11, signed into law, and it basically took away all of our rights, which meant that maybe this legislation was written way before 9-11 happened, meaning that they were waiting to put this into play. Would you agree with me? Well, 100%. Uh, the Patriot Act was actually written by Michael Shertoff. Michael Shertoff is an ultra, ultra Zionist extremist who actually as head of the criminal division of the Justice Department, oversaw the entire non-investigation of 9-11. Um, indeed, even without, as I do, taking apart every aspect of the official story of 9-11 in the book, just following the cover-up shows that uh, the official story uh, is not true. Otherwise, they wouldn't be desperately seeking to cover up what actually happened. Um, another ultra-Zionist called Philip Zelico was appointed by uh, Bush Cheney to oversee as uh, executive director the 9-11 Commission. A 9-11 Commission that's supposed to be the official investigation into 9-11 that uh, Bush and Cheney resisted till their knuckles turned white, actually having it all, then they um, announced that after public pressure, they would have an inquiry. You would have an inquiry into the biggest terrorist attack on American soil in American history. Well, they then decided, OK, well, we'll have a fallback position. We'll put Henry Kissinger in charge of it. Um, and of course, that was so ludicrous that uh, Kissinger had to stand down. And they replaced him in effect, although there were people like Thomas Keene who's supposed to be running it. They weren't. Thomas Keane, the chairman, who actually said that uh, the commission was set up to fail, exactly what it was, um, mm. uh, and they had Zelico actually running running the show. And what was left out of the 9-11 commission just tells the story. Um, for instance, uh, three buildings fell on 9-11. Most people seem to think, especially around the world, that only two did, the Twin Towers. No, a third one did. Building 7 at 5.20 in the afternoon, wasn't hit by a plane or anything. And um, if people go on the internet and put uh, Building 7 uh, 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 collapse, they will see the most blatant controlled demolition you will ever see. Um, and uh, they actually came out, this is the official story, Clyde, this is the official story that a 47-story steel frame building, Building 7, came down because of office furnishings fires. Um, it's completely ludicrous. And to, to 
uh, put that out in the commission report, people would have said, this is ridiculous. So how did they get by it? How did Zelico get by it? They don't even mention Building 7 in the 9-11 commission report, one of three buildings that fell, because they can't explain it other than a controlled demolition. Exactly. And uh, th those are some things that uh, certainly a lot of people remember. Of course, when you jog their memory, they remember this uh, about what happened at 9-11 and how they, it went from then till now, a constant fall apart, a constant. It's like we're under controlled demolition with wrecking ball operations that are to destroy what this country stands for. And it's gone back. And I said back to 9-11, we always go back to where they say we all united. But in reality, it started the pull apart and started the division, an established system like ours and others, can knit corruption into government constructs, where the law itself grants immunity in a way that makes successful prosecution the exception, especially when it comes to those who are truly the criminals that were involved in 9-11. In fact, we uh, talked uh, a few days ago, but right on the 9-11 anniversary, about how Robert Mueller was the investigator, didn't do much to investigate 9-11, didn't reveal much. But here's something that's interesting I want to kind of share with you. We'll get back to David. Did you know the overall cost for investigating the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster totaled $100 million? The Columbia disaster investigation came in at a whopping $175 million. When it comes to alleged criminal activity or wrongdoing with a political figure or alphabet agency, investigation budgets are much lower. The investigation of Watergate, that totaled $12 million. The Clinton Lewinsky scandal investigation cost $30 million. Iran Contra ran up a total of $35 million. Now, the investigations of the September 11th tax only totaled $3 million. That was $3 million, an allowance given to the 9-11 Commission and Congress to subsequently basically investigate. And then, of course, the president says, well, that's not enough. So he signed into law an additional $11 million appropriation for the commission. Then they had to beg for more money. But then after haggling and begging, $15 million was what they finally landed on, which is still a lot less than investigating a stain on a blue dress. How much money... Are we going to be putting forward to investigate Donald Trump for malfeasance and his impeachment? Is there moving forward with that? David Icke is with us tonight on Ground Zero. The book is called The Trigger, The Lie That Changed the World, Who Really uh, Did It and Why. It seems the same names always uh, come up when you're doing searches about who was behind 9-11 and what was the uh, intent, especially with something called the Project for the New American Century. Uh, yeah, um, I can give you a, a, a quick um, sequence um, one of the things that I expose in the book is a secret society, uh, a, actually a death cult, uh, goes under the name of Sabbatean Frankism, which we might get into the history of that a bit, a bit later, maybe. But um, just think of a, a, a death cult. And um, one of the uh, expressions of this death cult, and there are many others, is that cabal that controls Israel, controls Mossad, controls the... Um, uh, Israeli military, etc. Um, and these are not actually Jewish people in the sense of we would perceive Jewish people. These are interlopers, which go back, uh, it's this cult goes back um, at least to the 17th century. Um, and they're interlopers that uh, took over Israel, or actually created Israel. Uh, they, they manifest also as the Saudi Arabian royal family, or fake royal family. And, and in 9-11, of course, you have a, a, a big accepted Saudi involvement um, with most of the alleged hijackers, uh, alleged, uh, being uh, Saudi Arabian. Um, but what's lost, and it's lost because it's systematically lost, is the fundamental involvement in 9-11, the central involvement with elements of the CIA and uh, the uh, American military and others, because this cult has infiltrated America big time. Um, and uh, you um, have this um, suppression of this fundamental central involvement of, of Israel, I say this cult that runs Israel. And so if we go through a quick sequence, in um, 1979, um, the so-called father of Israeli intelligence, a man called Issa Harel, uh, did an interview with an American journalist in which he predicted that Arab uh, uh, terrorists would target New York's biggest building. Um, he said they would do this because uh, buildings are a phallic symbol um, in the Islamic culture. They are a big time a phallic symbol in the uh, death cults culture, by the way. Um, and, uh, and therefore, uh, attacking that or, or, or something like that would 
um, break the spirit of America, basically, break mm -hmm. the confidence of America. That was basically the theme. Also in 1979, um, a guy called Benjamin Netanyahu started to um, organize conferences attended by the uh, uh, American elite. First one was in Jerusalem, second in 1984 was in America, in which these conferences were calling for, wait for it, a war on terror. And um, the um, a, a whole um, uh, sequence, which we maybe continue, are we going for a break now, Clyde? Yeah, we're going for a break now. Uh, and, we'll, I'll uh, continue so afterwards. Continue sure. it's, it's, an amazing, it's, it's an amazing sequence. Okay, we'll uh, talk with David I coming up. The book is The Trigger, The Lie That Changed the World, Who Really Did It and Why. A lot of things about 9-11 that leads up to where we are now with the division in this country and why we certainly are continually being divided. It's no longer the Hegelian dialectic of problem, uh, reaction, solution. It's now problem, reaction, outrage. And we have the external mob to take care of everything else. You know, the idea of you're either with us, you're with the terrorists and uh, all that stuff. This is where the division begins. This is where, you know, people were trying to make heads or tails about what was going on. They wanted to move on with their lives. But then we had this cloud that was looming over us all the time. We were convinced of the necessity of big government making big decisions that were unpopular and uncomfortable. And we were also very frightened at the time in our history, where the shadow of what happened would loom forever as a political football in the hands of the endgame strategists that would do anything to keep us in a state of flux. And when we were terrified and confused, we forgot that everything was happening in real time. And we hid, we fled, I mean, we ignored details, we ignored the warnings. And so when we revisit all this stuff, of course, the trigger, the lie that changed the world, who really did and why about 9-11, David Icke's book, we started hearing some of the underbelly that doesn't get reported in the mainstream as to how we have gotten from a time of division to an even greater point of division with the same names and the same people in the background making the decisions for us. And now we're on the road to impeachment. And now we're on the road to changing our form of government, changing our form of, of uh, what kind of government we have leading us from a constitutional republic to a socialist uh, type of uh, government. David Icke is with us tonight on Ground Zero. We're talking about that very thing. So, David, continue with what you were saying earlier. Yeah, there was this very clear sequence, which I lay out uh, in great detail in the book. Uh, as I said, uh, first of all, in 1979, you had the father of Israeli intelligence, as he was called, Issa Harel, predicting uh, an uh, Arab terrorist attack on New York's biggest building. Then same year, 79, Benjamin Netanyahu, and then in 1984 as well, organized conferences in Jerusalem and the United States, calling for preemptive strikes on terror states and a war on terrorism. He wrote a book as well, uh, calling for the same things. Then in 1996, Netanyahu became prime minister. He was prime minister then of, uh, of uh, Israel. And uh, he had a document produced for him by an ultra Zionist called Richard Pearl, of course, who was in a Pentagon position uh, in the 9-11 year of 2001. And it was called a clean break, a new um, strategy for securing the realm, i.e. Israel. And um, it called for, this is in 1996, it called for the invasion of Iraq to remove Saddam Hussein. Uh, to target um, Syria, to target Iran and so on. And it also said that it would be very good for Israel to have every kind of inter-Arab conflict that they could um, make happen. Then in 1997, the following year, Richard Pearl, the same Richard Pearl, along with another group of um, ultra-Zionists and people who were in major positions in the Bush administration at the time of 9-11, they created uh, an organization you mentioned earlier called the Project of the New American Century. This was um, co-founded by ultra-Zionists, uh, Bill Crystal and Robert Kagan. And in this group were Dick Cheney, who would be 9-11 de facto president, vice president uh, officially, Donald Rumsfeld, who would be 9-11 Defense Secretary, Paul Wolfowitz, who would be his deputy in the Pentagon, Zav Zakheim, who um, would be the comptroller of the Pentagon at the time of 9-11, uh, overseeing the entire Pentagon budget, uh, which uh, somehow 
managed to um, lose, um, quote, more than two uh, trillion dollars. And um, the fact that that two trillion dollars was lost was announced on September the 10th. 2001 and something happened the following day which took that completely out of the headlines and out of the newspapers just a coincidence nothing to worry about also in this group was uh, Richard Pearl the guy from the clean break document and a, a, a document would be produced by the project in American century I'll come to in a second which was basically a mirror in in so many ways of a clean break and another guy involved in the project in American century was John Bolton who until very recently was National Security Advisor to Trump, um, pushing a series of um, uh, wars and, and uh, attacks on, on the very countries named in uh, 2000, uh, uh, the year 2000, September 2000, by this project, the New American Century. Because what happened is that um, in September 2000, the project, the New American Century, um, published a document which um, called for um, American... Um, uh, troops to fight and decisively win multiple uh, simultaneous major theater wars in the uh, in the Middle East and elsewhere to uh, regime change a series of countries. Uh, the countries they named were Iraq, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, North Korea, leading to regime change in China, plus some others. And by the way, this group in 1998 um, sent a letter to Bill Clinton, then president, calling for him to remove Saddam because Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. You can see the sequence. So in this document in September 2000, um, they say that this um, series of regime changes they wanted American troops to, uh, to instigate in the Middle East would um, would not happen very quickly unless America had its uh, own 21st century uh, Pearl Harbor. The document said this process, the process of transformation, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event like a new Pearl Harbor. Twelve months to the month after that document was published, nine months after the people that wrote it came to power with Bush, America had what Bush called at the time the Pearl Harbor of the um, 21st century, our Pearl uh, Harbor. And the New York Times uh, reported um, uh, just after 9-11 that the Pentagon Policy Board, which was absolutely awash with these people from the Project for the New American Century, including Richard Pearl, had met on September 19th and 20th after 9-11 to plot the removal of Saddam Hussein. Then you had Wesley Clark, um, General Wesley Clark, who of course was a, a big Whig and uh, big uh, man in NATO at one point, um, he was interviewed on uh, an internet show called Democracy Now! in 2007, and he told the story of going to the Pentagon immediately after 9-11, meeting with Rumsfeld, meeting with Wolfowitz, and then going downstairs and meeting a, a, a general friend of his from um, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the uniform level of the Pentagon. And this uh, general, he said, told him that they were going to invade Iraq. This is days after 9-11. And uh, Clark said, well, what do you mean we're going to invade Iraq? Were they involved in 9-11? The general said, well, we, we, we don't think so, but, but, but we're going to invade Iraq, apparently. And because of compartmentalization, fierce compartmentalization, this general re really wouldn't know what the game was at all. Just does as he's told. Anyway, Clark said he went away, came back a few weeks later. While by this time, uh, America is uh, in Afghanistan, something that just like um, the Patriot Act had to be organized long before actually the invasion took place of Afghanistan. And uh, he said he met the same general and uh, he said to the general, I thought we were invading Iraq. Why haven't we invaded Iraq? And the general said to him, uh, well, it's worse than that, sir. 
we're going to invade seven countries in five years. And he named them. And those countries were straight off the pages of the Project for the New American Century document. And since then, those countries, um, because of the trigger of 9-11, have been picked off. And have they been picked off under apparently different administrations? So you had uh, Republican Bush and Labour Party, uh, Tony Blair in Britain, um, lying to invade Iraq. Why did they lie about weapons of mass destruction, something that these ultra-Zionists were talking about years and years before? Um, because they didn't have an excuse to invade Iraq. Uh, it was on the list for invasion, so they had to make one up. Then Bush and Blair, they, they disappear, and in come Democrat Obama and Conservative Party Prime Minister David Cameron, and they oversee the removal of um, Gaddafi in Libya on the list and the start of the catastrophe that has become uh, Syria. Um, and without the intervention of uh, Russia, um, they would have regime changed Syria long ago. And then they go away and in comes the maverick, uh, Donald Trump, and uh, th th his regime starts to target um, starts to target Iran. And of course, the, the key to this Iran thing kicking off was um, walking away from the Iran nuclear deal, which the Trump administration has done. And Benjamin Netanyahu um, was caught. Uh, he didn't realize he was caught, but he was caught in a, in a recording actually claiming that um, Trump dropped the uh, nuclear deal with Iran. So kicking all this off because of pressure from uh, Netanyahu and uh, and Israel. And then you look at 9-11, um, and I, I go into this in detail into the second half of the book, and ultra-Zionists were involved in every aspect of 9-11, not least um, uh, the cover-up. Uh, you had an ultra-Zionist in um, Larry Silverstein and, uh, and also a guy called Frank Lowey that bought the lease to the um, Twin Towers, he, uh, Silverstein already owned the uh, uh, Building 7 in the World Trade Center complex. Uh, basically, weeks before 9-11, Silverstein increased the uh, insurance on the buildings in the case of a terrorist attack. And for his personal contribution of $14 million into the initial buying of the lease, um, the payout in insurance was $4.5 billion. Uh, dollars. I also show in the book how Israeli intelligence um, front organizations uh, were trying from at least 1987 to uh, control the security of the Twin Towers, which they uh, did at the time of 9-11. Uh, you had Larry Silverstein so close to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. This is from uh, sources like Haaretz, the uh, Israeli newspaper, that they spoke on the phone every Sunday uh, because they were longtime uh, pals. Uh, 